Okay, good evening everybody. My name is Hannah Lowe and I'm Assistant Project Coordinator and Research Fellow here at the Dialogue Society. And I will be hosting tonight's panel discussion on the implications of racism on mental health, overcoming structural obstacles. So I want to thank everybody for joining us and I hope you all enjoy the evening and are able to learn something, be challenged and take something positive away from what you hear tonight. Um, the Dialogue Society is hosting this panel on racial equality with the aim of highlighting the multifaceted and layered dimensions of racism and how this negatively impacts society. Moving from individual experiences to the impact racism has more broadly in our workplaces, politics and culture, this panel series aims to focus on positive approaches that work towards the goal of racial equality. So each panel that we have run focuses on a particular theme and today's panel discussion is on the implications of racism on mental health and it aims to explore the relationship between mental health and racism through a structural and institutional lens and uncover some of the factors that lead to negative mental health consequences among BIPOC and the barriers that prevent BIPOC from accessing mental health treatment and also establish how we can ensure effective treatment is accessible for all. So just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speakers. If everybody can keep themselves muted unless they're speaking, that would be great. And viewers, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box or in the comments on YouTube, and we'll have time for a questions and answer session at the end. So our first speaker today will be Sue Lybird, MBE, who is an award-winning businesswoman in human capital innovation with a special interest in assisting underrepresented groups achieve success. She is the Deputy Chair of Armed Forces Public Patient Voice Advisory Group, Non-Executive Director for NHS Lincolnshire Clinical Commissioning Group, the Intern Group and of Abstract UK and International. And she is also Deputy Lieutenant for Gov.UK. And following Sue, we will hear from Professor Kamal Deep Bai, CBE, who is a Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford and Editor-in-Chief of the British Journal of Psychiatry. Kamal Deeb is also honorary consultant psychiatrist in the NHS and director of the Synergy Collaborative Centre. And he's the director of the World Psychi Psychiatric Association and board trustee for the Centre for Mental Health. And then finally tonight, we will hear from Shiren Jeet Singh, the founder and director of Taraki, an organisation that works with Punjabi communities around the UK to reshape approaches to mental health and connects with a global social media audience on the topics of awareness, education, social support and research. Jiranji is also an independent advisor and consultant for the Wellcome Trust, a lived experience consultant for Flourish Labs and is on the interim board of directors for the Healthy Brains Global Initiative. So we're really honored to have each three of our speakers tonight. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to our first speaker tonight, Sue Lightbird. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so good evening, everybody. I am. I have brought a couple of slides, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and what I'm proposing to do over the next, uh, hopefully you can all see that. Um, what I'm proposing to do over the next, um, you know, ten minutes or so is just uh, walk you through um, three particular uh, streams. First of all, anybody that's heard me speak before always know that I start with what I call the uncomfortable truths. So, um, and these are uncomfortable truths as I see them from uh, my research and my experience. Um, and then what I want to do is just walk briefly through what I call, you know, the user journey. Um, and then hopefully just finish off with a couple of things that possibly we could think about doing in um, overcoming some of the, the challenges around racial disparity in mental health. Um, so very much uh, through an organisational, structural um, and institutional lens is, is, is where I'm, I'm, I'm playing. So let me start with um, some uncomfortable truths as, as, as I see them. So um, first of all, 
for me, it's, it's really important that uh, we all recognise uh, racism is a stressor. And one of the things we know about stress is that long term and chronic, um, and chronic stress can affect our physical and, and, and mental health and well being. Um, and the thing about um, racism is that, let me just narrow that a little, there we go. The thing about um, racism is that it's, it, it's cumulative when, when it comes to our health and well being. Day to day indignities become cumulative and hence. Um, as I've said, they can lead to some um, challenges uh, over a longer period of time. You combine that with um, this third point that um, we're talking about, you know, ethnic minority communities being disproportionately impacted by what we call those social determinants. Um, and the social determinants particularly associated um, with mental health, what are, what are we talking about? We, when we talk about social determinants, we're talking about the conditions in which people are born, that they grow, we're educated, that we work, we live, we age, we die. So it's those different life stages that we have and what are all of the things that can have an impact on those. So things like housing, things like education, um, access to affordable food, good food, good nutrition, access to you know, water, employment opportunity so those are things that we talk about in terms of social determinants and if there's one thing we have become very much aware of particularly this last 18 months um, for anybody that wasn't aware um, that you know when we're talking about uh, ethnic minority communities we've got high levels of uh, health inequality and health disparity compared with other groups in society so um you combine that with this cumulative um, effect that I've been talking about, then we know then we're, we're as, as, as minority communities are at higher risk of um, some of the challenges with regards to mental health. Um, also, and I'm sure, you know, um, some of my fellow panelists will pick up on this one as well, is that our experience of the mental health services is also um, uh, different to other groups. And um, so it's not just about how we come in contact with mental health services, it's our experience also um, that can lead to poorer outcomes. Um, which, like I say, hopefully, you know, this evening we will come up with some ideas and some, some thinking to, to uh, rectify that. Um, but of course, there are a huge number of barriers um, to us accessing mental, uh, good mental health care. And, um, and that's where I want to, to touch on now. So the uncomfortable truth is that, you know, we as um, minority communities, um, comparatively high risk of mental, uh, poor mental health. Um, we have um, social determinants that impact us. L over a long period of time, we get um, chronic um, um, illnesses pr uh, present, physical and mental. Um, and um, that when we do access the service, we're, we're, it can be a real challenge too. So let's unpack that a little, shall we? So if we look at our, our, our journey, um, you know, there are things like, you know, challenges that we experience in terms of accessing the service. There's challenges we experience when we, we're in an assessment phase of, of, of mental health services, the treatment phase, the recovery phase. So when we look at access, all right, there's a couple of, you know, there's three key points that resonate for me. Um, and that first one is important because we're less likely to access mental health support in primary care and um, um, for those of you that don't know primary care think of primary care as the gp service so this is you know our, our first port of call for a lot of people and it's a bit like triage really we, we arrive at our, our, our gps uh, presenting with a, a, a set of you know symptoms or conditions or concerns and then of course um, then what happens is our GPs refer us into the you know, secondary care system, which is um, you know, things like hospitals and, and clinics and, and screening. So um, we're less likely um, as ethnic minorities to be able to access uh, mental health support via primary care. A second point is um, I also think is quite interesting, and that is around um, that 40% of um, 
uh, ethnic minorities, and particularly in, in this particular statistic relates very much to um, the black community, I must, uh, must confess, um, access by the criminal justice system compared with white people. Um, that is, for me, quite shocking. Uh, we're talking about um, a, a prison population, for example, or a criminal justice system that has something like um, just under 30% um, of black or Asian people sitting in the, the criminal justice system. And 40% of those of that community uh, um, are more likely to access mental health services. Um, uncomfortable, it's an uncomfortable um, uh, for me statistic. And then what we have are, you know, other determinants in, that become barriers in terms of people being able to access um, mental health services. So, you know, for example, you know, someone's immigration status or um, some people, of course, um, are, are charged for their services in terms of accessing the NHS. We may have language barriers, um, may just genuinely have poor access to information about the services that are, that are available to people. Um, all of these things can act as deterrents and restrict access to, to those services. And I say that not as just somebody who is involved in the NHS um, at a national level or in, in involved in the NHS uh, at a regional level um, and locally uh, in Lincolnshire. Um, my early part of my career, um, I, I trained in, um, as a, a mental health nurse. And so some of these um, things I'm sharing with you today are around things that I have seen as well as some of the research that I'm actively involved in when it comes to accessing services. So access, we have challenges in terms of um, uh, our, our systems. When we look then at um, um, ass the assessment phase, one of the things that we find is that, um, that because we often access quite late, so there are barriers, there, we, we may not trust the system, some of those determinants that I've talked about, we access sometimes quite late. What we find is that we sometimes have poor physical health conditions. And so quite rightly um, and understandably, what we'll find is then that doctors will focus on the physical condition. That makes absolute sense. Um, but one of the challenges with that is sometimes what we're finding is that um, that focus very much on the physical, sometimes we get into um, some of that, what we call clinician bias, not actually recognizing um, that um, it could be some of the um, mental health challenges that we're having. So, you know, maybe depression, for example, chronic stress, um, cardiovascular disease, um, whereby health conditions and mental health conditions can have an impact on, on, on the diagnosis of those conditions as well. So, um, and some of those diseases, as you can see from my last point, you know, um, are complicated. Some of the physical uh, um, conditions that we, we experience in our communities can be complicated by our mental health conditions. So assessment um, equally has some bias um, built into uh, that process. That can actually find us presenting late, or not being treated um, as favorably as maybe some other uh, groups within our society. So assessment. Um, when it comes to looking then at, at, at treatment, what we find is that um, some inequalities still persist and um, some of the research is showing that quite strongly. Um, and one of the things is that, you know, that treatment, the, the, the treatment experience also can have a, a, an impact on, on, on how people recover from however, um, whatever um, condition that they're presenting with. So we have it in terms of challenges, in terms of access. Once people have actually managed to get through the door, their experience and the treatment that they have um, can have a, a, an impact on their recovery. That's the point that I'm making here. Um, but one of the things that I think is, for me, quite concerning is um, because of the challenges that a lot of people have, like I say, present quite late, um, quite often then what happens is we get um, into what we call crisis treatment, crisis management, a bias towards medication, as opposed to, for example, some of the talking therapies or some of the other alternative uh, therapies that are available in terms of mental health. 
and maybe you know during the uh, the Q and A we can unpack some of that. So we see inequalities also in in the in the treatment phase. So when we come then to the recovery phase, as I've already said, you know, one of the things, the experience that people have can have an impact on their chances of recovery. Um, and that's really important. Um, so when we start to look at what are some of the things that we can do um, to mitigate against this, to, you know, improve recovery times, um, uh, uh, and, and improve people's access, then um, we really do need, do need to take a look at a little deeper dive at uh, some of those discriminatory experiences. And these are some of the lived experiences that people share. Um, and of course, um, these lived experiences that, that people are, are, are having um, spread out into our communities, you know, and build some distrust, understandably, um, build some anxiety and some concern about whether or not uh, somebody should present. Um, also, one of the challenges that we have, of course, is that we have a, a healthcare system that um, is biased towards um, our, you know, being Eurocentric. So it's biased towards the majority um, as opposed to the minority. So sometimes what we've got is low cultural intelligence in terms of the services that we provide when it comes to um, mental health services. So some of that is built into the DNA of, of just how um, the NHS is, is structured. So what are some of the things um, that we can, can do? So, um, one of the key things is, is around commissioning and I put here this, this first point, diversity of voice in public patient forums. So the NHS is mandated, it's part of its constitution. So in commissioning services, in designing services, so designing, for example, a care pathway, um, the NHS is required to consult with um, service users. So it's, con it's required to consult with, cons uh, with citizens. So one of the important things is for everybody, so particularly if you come from um, a, an ethnic minority group, is to make sure that your voice is heard. So when there are surveys, it's important to participate. When you ask for feedback, it's important to participate so that we can get far more um, um, qualified, culturally sensitive, thought um, provoking um, changes in terms of some of the services that, that we're being provided in terms of mental health. Again, one of the things um, that's really important in terms of our communities are, is the, you know, our faith groups, our, our, our community groups. So actively getting involved in the design, as I've said, of, um, of care pathways. So there's something about us being proactive in terms of reaching out to those people at commissioning um, services, but equally it's important for, for what I call the system um, to also reach out um, and, and make sure that our voice is heard. Um, and speaking to the point that I made um, earlier, it's I think it's in, in incumbent on um, the health service to look at the broader aspect of, of, of healing systems yoga, meditation, complementary therapies, culturally sensitive practices that we have. So to mitigate against some of that, just what I call that Eurocentric uh, bias. So some things to think about when we're thinking about commissioning. All right. And um, I've been using the term cultural intelligence. Um, and this is just all I'm talking about here is being better understanding cultural and our faith beliefs. Um, in terms of the communities that we're in. And one of the things that um, we're seeing conversation taking place now is about when somebody presents into the system, can we match them with a, a champion, with a health buddy, with somebody that genuinely understands um, the cultural and linguistic um, or, 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 or racial um, identity that you know, um, service users, users are, have or what they bring in essence. Um, and can we also give more attention to the provision of culturally appropriate advice and support? 
So these are just some of the things just to be thinking about. But what we know is that at every single stage, when it comes to mental health and well-being, that there are challenges for um, our citizens, the members of the public, in terms of accessing mental health support. And it's incumbent on us as, as, as providers to be better educated, better informed, um, and for, far more um, culturally aware. Um, and it's incumbent on us, I, I argue, as, as citizens, also to take a bit more of a stance to make sure that we find ways to get our voices heard, whether it's that is as, as individuals or whether or not that is as um, via our various community groups. So I will pause there. I will stop sharing my screen and um, hand back over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Sue. That's just so great to have a really clear, informative um, talk about all of those things and at every level, the challenges that people face with mental health, mental health provision. Um, and yeah, thank you for talking about that uncomfortable truth and the reality of that for people and just really laying that out for us and making that really um, easy to understand. And I hope people have really gained a lot from hearing what you've had to say. And so I'm gonna pass over now to our next speaker, which is Professor Kamal Deep Boy. So over to you. Did it again, sorry. Thank you ever so much, Hannah, for organizing this meeting. It's not easy to talk about racism. So I want to start at the point uh, of why it's important to have conversations, why it's so difficult to have conversations. There's often a silence around inequalities and racism. Vocabularies don't seem to meet our political positions and ideologies, and so we end up not talking. We tend to fear conflict and disruption and misunderstanding and disrespect, and we fear latent identities being enacted and the histories of race politics exploding in the very conversation that we're having it. So it's really important to have good conversations and to find ways of sharing knowledge and information. And listening to people and their lived experience is a powerful way to capture all the complicated nuances that aren't usually available uh, from a distance, from boardrooms, from commissioning panels, and when we talk about things as intellectual objects rather than entangled experience. So that's my first key point. My second point is echoing what Sue said, racism is associated with mental illness and poor mental health. Of course, egregious acts of racism and violence are hurtful and upsetting. They've been considered to be part of what's been talked of as an adverse childhood experiences. The more adverse childhood experiences you have, the more likely your neurodevelopment to be affected, the poorer your educational experience, the more likely to, you are to have poor health problems. And indeed, if you have more than six to eight adverse childhood experiences, you have a shortened life expectancy by almost 20 years. This matches also the evidence on trauma. And if you think about discrimination as a trauma, it's associated with inflammation, poorer physical and mental health across all the diagnostic groups. It's, it's not unique. We know that the incidence of psychosis and schizophrenia are highest amongst ethnic minorities and migrants. And we've been trying to understand why and respond to it. One approach has been to say, well, this is a natural phenomena. It's inevitable. It's part of the natural history of the disease, but I don't buy that. And I think it's really important to understand what political structures and adversity, including adverse childhood experience and discrimination contribute to this. Of course, social determinants and the distribution of social determinants is important, but minorities also experience additional risk factors like discrimination and racism a lack of employment, lack of opportunity in education uh, and subtle negative responses in the workplace when they're seeking promotion, applying for jobs, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's really important to set that out. There's plenty of evidence. No one should doubt the evidence. My third key point is what I've been trying to tackle and resolve is the pathways that people take to get into care. We know from decades of research, some of it I started in the early 2000s and continue to replicate those findings that Minorities, and particularly Black African or Black Caribbean heritage populations, appear to come into contact with services through crisis, through the police, through the criminal justice system. So they can be very ill, but there's a criminalization here of people who are mentally ill. And the evidence from first episode cohort studies, which look at uh, psychosis as it's developing, 
is that they appear not to be very different from other groups. They appear not to have lots of substance misuse. Violence only explains 20% of the variants, and they appear not to have a psychopathy or personality disorders that people can attribute to being in contact with the police. So it's not easily explained why that happens. We also know that when they're in care, as Sue's outlined, they're more likely to get uh, uh, compulsory treatment, uh, medication rather than psychological therapies, where they do get psychological therapies, they don't benefit as much. You're three to four, and some studies say seven times as likely to be cared for under a section of the Mental Health Act. Again, some people see this as an inevitable natural consequence of antecedents without really unpacking what's going on in our policies and our structures. Of course, if there are early life events, they will lead to poorer outcomes, but we ought to be thinking about preventing that happening as well as what we do in services to reduce the likelihood of mental health act care. I'm fortunate to be involved in a national UKRI study looking at uh, mental health act and ethnicity and trying to co-design alternatives in seven cities up and down the country with service users, carers, the police, with uh, providers, managers and commissioners. And that, that study it will be going on for the next uh, uh, 14, 15 months, 18 months or so. So we do have to think about those things. Now, what could be driving all that? So social determinants, adverse childhood experiences, you have to look at school experience and education exclusion. You have to look at um, uh, the environment, deprivation, poverty, cluster disadvantage. The evidence is that these inequalities aren't just about ethnicity, but people of ethnic minority groups living in places of cluster disadvantage and being exposed to multiple unsafe environments including discrimination, but violence, poor education, lack of trust in the police, lack of trust in authorities, all of those combined in particular places to produce what's been called a syndemic, which appears to be the only plausible explanation that I've come across that might explain those higher rates of psychosis, but it's multiple complex interacting risk factors over the life course that lead to these poorer outcomes. We could in services, and we have traditionally said, that's nothing to do with us, unacceptable in my view. That's really important that we, first of all, acknowledge those things, we understand the biography and we factor those into our care and therapeutic processes, but also we do something about unpacking those structures. So that brings me to my fourth point about what is structural disadvantage and how do we go about tackling it? So the first thing is it's not easy because it's invisible. We're all conditioned to it and newer to it. Some of us can't see it. Some of us don't want to see it. Some of us have never had the experience and therefore are not entangled and don't wish to be. And unfortunately, those in positions of power and authority dominate those structures and processes rather than those with lived experience who are entangled in the experiences and might have a view about how to solve these problems. So we all have to be extremely self-aware, constantly vigilant, const something that minorities do anyway, we're constantly self-auditing, wondering what's going on when we're not being treated as well or something's not right in the environment or we, something that we didn't expect happens or someone doesn't want to talk to us or we didn't get the job that we doubly qualified for. Yeah, we constantly, but everybody then has to do that to really monitor processes and practices so what happens when you end up in the service? Is it the clinical assessor? Uh, is the body of knowledge that we call assessment and healthcare itself a product of a particular political heritage and a particular uh, process of producing knowledge, which in itself is flawed that we need to rethink? Uh, how do we deconstruct those experiences of assessment and treatment and care practices? How do we think about commissioning and providing care and the way services are organized because they're not really organized around people. There's a trade-off between being efficient, spending public monies in an efficient, efficient, effective way, being business efficient versus achieving equity, personalizing and being flexible and responsive to the needs of people. So we've been advocating in the Synergy Collaborative Center to always commission and provide care for the exception. Always look at the people who are left out that you're not providing appropriate care for and configure your services to ensure you address their needs. And you will be a bit closer to unpacking those political structures. It's not straightforward because we are products of a particular political economy. Uh, and if uh, commissioning happens in a particular climate, if adversarial uh, conflict is the only way to solve disagreement, which is what happens in Parliament, for example, if uh, that's the only solution, that's a problem. We need much more of a truth and reconciliation process to really identify and unpack those problems. And to do so with kindness, because people affected by this don't want to be the owners of the solution. They can't solve the problems themselves. Uh, and so it has to be a collective action by everyone. I will pause and stop there because I I'm aware that the structural issues are very, very substantially complex, and that's probably going to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamal Deep. That's just so great to hear your insight on that. And 
um, how the biases towards ethnic minorities within the healthcare system. And yeah, the very complex factors um, that go towards the, you know, the inequalities that we see there. And thank you for pointing out how, you know, all of us need to be very much more aware of the issues and, you know, the ways that we can think about unpacking the political structures and the institutional racism that is kind of underlying a lot of these issues. And so I'm going to pass over to our next speaker, who will be Suranjit Singh. So over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you to all the rest of the panelists, because I feel we all bring a very unique perspective on this discussion coming from a whole load of different angles, uh, whether it's organizational discussion, healthcare, specifically kind of healthcare commissioning, healthcare services related discussion, academia research. And hopefully I'll try and add to that from a bit of a kind of grassroots and a lived experience perspective. Uh, so a little bit of background about the work that I do at Taraki. Um, so Taraki is an organization I founded um, about three and a half years ago, uh, which focuses on reshaping approaches to mental health alongside Punjabi communities. And you might be thinking, you know, what relevance has this got to the discussion we're having today? But for me, uh, I started Taraki in October 2017 uh, because of my experiences and mental health challenges, uh, which were very much pushed and started through my transition from home, which for me is Birmingham, uh, to my transition to university for undergrad. And being a very visibly Sikh man, you know, turban beard, all that stuff, um, it was a huge culture shock uh, moving from a space which, uh, in which I uh, felt very much um, close and within kind of proximity to the people around me. I felt as though I didn't stick out. I felt as though I was a part of the furniture in the community I was born and raised in. But suddenly, when I went to university, which is already a difficult transition period for any young person, you know, leaving school, whether it's university, going to going into work, that transition phase is incredibly hard. And with that came a whole load of different challenges, which were racialized in nature. I racialized up until the point that I felt as, you know, um, I felt in my way, that if I wanted to fit in, um, I should remove my turban, I should stop wearing it, and I should try and assimilate in a different way. And you know, lo and behold, that actually didn't really solve any of the challenges that I was experiencing. And it actually made things a bit worse. And it led to me isolating myself more and more. It led to me cutting myself off from friends and family back home. I didn't speak to them about my challenges, not because I didn't think they would understand, but because I wanted to be seen as living independently. I wanted to be seen as looking after myself, being the first in my family to leave, leave Birmingham and go to university and not wanting folks to worry about me. And these experiences, it was only later after they had really happened that I was able to reflect on them and think about how this had impacted me in my, in my time at university. Um, you know, whether it was isolating myself from those around me, whether it was kind of changing my appearance and really trying to be someone uh, who deep inside I knew I wasn't. Um, and whether it was, you know, the various other things connected to that, you know, not really having many friends on my program not really being able to speak to people openly, not really being able to be myself um, at heart. These were various things that compounded and created you know, a, a situation where I wasn't able to be the person I wanted to be. I wasn't able to live my life how I wanted to live it. But I got very, very lucky and I feel very humble to have been able to access support through my housemates not necessarily through you know professional services not necessarily through university services but through a space that we were able to craft together which was open and honest it was a space where we could be ourselves without being ashamed and uniquely that was probably the only space at uni i could be myself without being ashamed um and it was a, it was a space where i feel and i hope that all of us felt that way as well and it was after these experiences that i looked at that i looked at these experiences um of various types of exclusion, various types of difficulties at university, uh, some of which were racialized. I looked at them, I thought I was so lucky to have support through that process. Even though the support didn't come until fairly long down the line, I was lucky to have that support. And I identified that there were many people in the communities I grew up in where that support wasn't necessarily accessible. That support wasn't something that was even an option. It wasn't you know, identifying that one needed support wasn't even kind of something that was on the on the table for many people. And, you know, you might be asking, how is this related to racism? But for me, 
the, 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 the very question, the very kind of crux of the matters that we're experiencing, um, I was experiencing were related to um, ostracization, exclusion, and many of which were very much interlocked within experiences of racialization. And so our work is focused on Punjabi communities. And, you know, we often are asked, why don't you focus on black and minority ethnic communities more widely? Why don't you focus on everyone? And my response to that is, why would we run before we can walk? Um, why would we try and uh, look at a hugely complex area uh, with a team of volunteers? Why would we try and speak to the experiences of people who we don't necessarily uh, kind of we don't necessarily identify with. We don't necessarily have these experiences, even though they, we, they might be some similar features, but I really, really wanted to appreciate nuance and I really wanted to appreciate the pluralities within racialized communities, rather than trying to reduce people and backgrounds and cultures into a monolith, rather than kind of assimilating people into a category that looks to uh, kind of homogenize. Um, I wanted to really try and take an approach that appreciated diversity within diversity. And I really like the kind of the term that uh, the term that uh, Professor Bui used earlier around kind of compound, compounded disadvantage. Um, so really thinking about how these things intersect um, and how these experiences are unique, even in communities we feel are, are one. And so our approach, our Kind of way of approaching our community work is itself we try to be based in anti-racist tenets uh, because you know this is something that is incredibly important not only to how we started but to how we look to move and how we look to go moving forwards and so Traki at its core tries to work towards these principles um, and I've been very lucky to kind of uh, have been engaged in different kinds of work in the mental health landscape around research around lived experiences and it's really important at this point for me to identify that we can be speaking about uh, kind of how racism impacts uh, kind of grassroots discussions and, and grassroots community work, but also uh, racism and racist structures and different types of exclusion and oppression are also present in research. Um, and they're also present in the lived experience sector as well. And I really enjoyed when Sue mentioned that earlier on, uh, particularly around patient public engagement. So quite quickly, I recognize that people, organizations, uh, you know, uh, institutions would reach out to us at Taraki and say, hey, can you help us uh, disseminate this research? Can you help us translate this research, these research findings into a different language? And at the beginning, I was always very excited to do that because we were getting attention and people were seeing us and we were working alongside, um, you know, big organizations and all that kind of thing. But quite quickly, I realized that we didn't actually have a seat at the research table earlier on. We were kind of just an add-on at the end, uh, a tick box for people to say they've engaged with Punjabi communities. They have translated their work into different languages. They have uh, sent, the, sent the findings of the research, which would otherwise be gathering digital dust. They've sent these findings into the communities who are often excluded from conversations around research. And this really got me thinking a lot about processes of inclusion and exclusion within the research space. And quite quickly, uh, I was seeing a lot of discussion uh, that really tried to uh, pigeonhole our roles within research. It tried to say that you can be involved, but you, know, you need to be involved here. And one of, the, one of the classic ones I always get is, can you help us recruit research participants? And it's like, it's just a mirror image of other kinds of exploitative relationships we've seen in the past where, you know, you're not at the table actually trying to think about the strategy for this research, the direction of the research, what we're actually trying to think about and question in the research, but we are just, you know, the people to be asked, uh, the objects of research, um, vessels from which knowledge is taken and knowledge is, you know, uh, put, into, put into words that will never actually reach us. <laughs> Uh, words that will never actually be accessible to many within our communities. And so it was these, these small experiences that made me recognize that racism, racist kind of uh, logics are things that are present within research. And as Cam mentioned, uh, there, are, there are things that we need to speak to. We need to speak to bravely and we need to speak to fearlessly because otherwise things will continue as they have always done. And I'm just going to say a small, a small anecdote related to the research that we started doing ourselves, uh, because, you know, we, we, we quickly recognized that 
uh, research, we were being uh, pigeonholed within existing research infrastructure. Um, people were asking us to be uh, co, what was it, co, co study partners on, on, on research initiatives, um, but we didn't actually really have much of a say in what that research was looking into. Um, it was more of a thing to gloss out and like make, make funding applications look a bit better. Um, and so we decided to start doing our own research to really guide our work and our practice. Um, and so this started with very, very basic, um, a kind of very basic audience assessment needs assessment around COVID-19. And one of the main questions we asked in that research <clears throat> was how have our communities been supporting themselves through COVID-19 and lockdown? How have they been supporting their mental health and well-being? And because of our understanding and our experiences of these communities, one of the options on our list was faith. And it turns out that 40% of people who responded to this survey have been using faith and faith um, kind of based practice as a way of supporting themselves during the pandemic. Um, and so we actually were able to kind of speak to these topics that were otherwise very much excluded within the mental health research landscape. These are topics that aren't necessarily taken seriously at the same level as other topics within the mental health research landscape. And the only reason we we're able to do this is because we were the drivers of that research. We sat at the table and we discussed amongst ourselves, how do we want to take this forward? And what that has led to, it's led to us being able to create an evidence base that is created and kind of driven forward by the communities we work with, rather than us being told what's important from the outside. We take, we take inspiration from the different, uh, different uh, lines of argument and lines of uh, inquiry that we see within our society more broadly, but we try and make it more adaptable and more specific to our communities. And since we um, did that COVID-19 related research, we've had a whole load of other initiatives that have come because of that, because we've identified these particular challenges. We've identified that Punjabi people who identify as LGBTQ plus were experiencing particular challenges around isolation. So we're able to actually work towards uh, the development of, of spaces and infrastructure to better support them. And this is because we were able to actually uh, center the voices of people in our communities. We were able to understand the complexities within Punjabi communities and actually uh, take forward initiatives through, our, through our, um, our kind of direction rather than a direction that had been imposed onto us. And, you know, just, just to finish, I finally want to, finally want, want to just talk a bit about uh, the lived experience landscape. Uh, you know, lived experience, uh, particularly within the mental health landscape, is a, is a term, is a phrase that has been increasingly popular over the last several years. Everyone's talking about lived experience now. Everyone's talking about the importance of experiential knowledge, the, the importance of uh, the people who are uh, going through or have experienced particular challenges, particular, particularly related to mental health, whether that's incarceration, whether that's um, kind of uh, service use, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the lived experience landscape is one that is not neutral. It's not a ground that uh, is automatically inclusive and is automatically open and welcoming to people from different parts of our society. And I think there is a huge, huge gap in actually trying to understand how racial structures and other types of oppression and discrimination function within the lived experience landscape. I remember I had a lecture once and it was about patient public involvement. And they, they put a slide up of, of their patient and public involvement team. And there were no racialized folks in that team. And for me, that really, really just outlines some of the core issues that we can experience within the lived experience landscape, the patient public involvement landscape. Even though these terms and these concepts may seem as though they're doing things differently, unless we actually hold these things to account in how they're practiced and how they're taken forward, then we'll just replicate the structures that have got us hit back here into this position in the first place. And so within the lived experience landscape, my question and my understanding isn't necessarily about equality, but more about equity. You know, we can put we can put a job description out, a job application out for a lived experience position and send it to people and organizations. But that doesn't mean that everyone feels equipped or comfortable or confident with putting in an application for these roles. And so for me, it's thinking about how do we actually work with communities who are systemically disadvantaged when it comes to patient and public involvement to actually build capacity and build skills and share knowledge that they have been hugely excluded from um, to actually give us all um, a, an opportunity to be able to 
access this type of work, access these types of roles? How can people with lived experiences and mental health challenges from racialized backgrounds get more involved with research, leading research, more involved with understanding funding mechanisms, deciding on funding, you know, interviewing for you know, high, high ranking positions within our healthcare system? How can we ensure that these things become a part of the institutional fabric? And I appreciate that I've not put a whole load of solutions forward and you know, ask more questions and stuff. Um, but you know, as 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 Professor Bree mentioned, you know, we have we have a whole load of uh, we have co topics that are ridiculously complex and things that are so multifaceted that even though we, three of us have speak, spoken on these topics today, there are still so many angles we haven't been been able to cover. Uh, but I hope I was able to cover some unique angles and been able to build on the discussion of uh, my co-panelists as well. Um, and just want to say a huge thank you as well for allowing me the space today. Thank you so much, Sharanji. It's so great to have you share your own experiences as a catalyst for starting Turkey and then also experiences with that and your time with research and need to centre the Punjabi community within your own research and yeah, it's really great to hear that and hear your, your take on that. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor now to a question and answer session. And I know we've um, heard some three really different, really interesting, engaging talks. I just wondered if any of our panellists had any questions for the other panellists on anything that you've heard. I mean, I think I'll def def defer to your audience, really, because there's so many things I could ask and we could chat for, at length. And uh, um, other than to say, uh, what brilliant presentation from Sue and Shuranjit and uh, remarkable. I was going to say it's an, you know, an echoing, um, you know, Kandit's um, comment, you know, again, you know, really interesting. I, I, as I've said already, when um, I come to a Dialogue Society event, I walk away with some nuggets and, and listening to the other panellists, you know, um, some things really cemented and, and, and some nuggets. But um, a, a question actually, and um, Kamaldeep, if you don't mind, and you, you talked about kindness um, and you know, when you were talking about truth and, and reconciliation, have you got some thought about how we can build kindness into, you know, the system? And I say into the system as, as the NHS, as you're aware, is moving to an integrated care system. Um, so how do we factor in kindness to make sure that um, it, it mm. covers the points that you're making? It's a really important question. And is it a sad question that we have to think about kindness in healthcare and, and social care? Uh, it's a terrible thing. But this is kind of what happens in systems when they oppress people's values and ethics and approach. Somehow the trainings that we get, somehow the systems we work in need to understand that they are making life harder for the workforce and for um, patients and the public when they use those services. But when racism is at play, I guess I was referring to what it does to people who are victims, but also what it does to people who are trying to solve the problem and really are terrified, ashamed and humiliate, feel humiliated by the realisation that they're part of the problem. And in those sort of conversations, uh, I guess there needs to be courage as you do approach the problem. But uh, I, I really take that word from uh, Maya Angelou's uh, um, you know, narrative that, uh, you know, astonish the world with your kindness. That's one of the only things left to us when you're in a position of disempowerment and you you don't know how to go so I take it from there and say well, you we should all be nurturing it and having these conversations and finding a way to better understand to refine our vocabularies and be brave in that because it's not an easy thing to do to be kind when you think you're being criticized or attacked thank you if if Shirendi, if you have a question um then feel free to ask or if not yeah i know i was just gonna say it's I, I love that kindness question um and i think for me there is so much that you know our our research landscape our formal big in healthcare uh, you know health services have to learn from community-based organizations um and especially community organizations who are working to who are speaking to lots of the gaps that we've identified in our healthcare systems. 
you know, locally, I'm based in Birmingham and Hansworth. And there are a number of community based organizations who do unbelievably important grassroots uh, work with the most and the sweetest kindness I've ever seen in my life. And it often reminds me that we can become lost in our institutions very, very easily and we can lose track of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so how do we incorporate these uh, these values, uh, you know, how do we incorporate them in both the way we speak and communicate, but also the way we act? And I really do think there are many, many community based organizations who are not only talking the talk, but they're walking the walk. Um, and we have so much to learn from them. Um, and I think that's where the that's where the answer lies. It's the, the, that type of that type of energy between uh, between breaths. It's that type of energy once we think all the energy is gone but people still manage to show and manage to role model the most, the most kind of astounding levels of compassion and kindness. That, that is, that, they're the, that's the gold dust for me. Thank you. And we've had a question actually about this last year that we've all experienced. Um, arguably the pandemic would have negatively affected the mental health of many BIPOC as they have been disproportionately hit by COVID-19. What can they do, and um, I might add, what can health services do during this difficult period to overcome the issues they may be facing? Who wants to go first? I, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kick off. Um, I mean, people have been incredible. You know, it, it, it's, it's no question that the, the pandemic has worsened the situation, but what it's also done has broken through that lack of awareness and, and exposed all our structural problems in our organizations, in our professional practice, in our ways of talking and relating. Still, there are people to convince because still pe some people still don't think that's a problem, that this is just what happens, but it's exposed how the way we organize society and what we value hasn't been right. And there are vulnerable people within that and minorities being particularly there, but marginalized groups um, generally. Uh, and then those inequalities have been deepened and how do we respond? We have to respond by being kind and recognizing um, the challenges everyone's facing, but we do have to really let the um, blinkers fall from our eyes to look at the structures and processes which have made some people so vulnerable so there's beginning to be work around that individuals and groups and families surely it said it all really community networks contact is harder when you're not able to see people but it's so important um, social support and friendship and kindness such powerful influences and forces and, and we really need to be able to nurture that and to connect with each other and to when we find divisions and opposition, you know, to have a respectful disagreement, but still to maintain that emotional connection and relational responsibility we have to each other to care for each other and make sure that we have a, a better collective approach to what we're doing. And that's really important for me. But I think people have resorted to faith, they've resorted to activity. Some people have found um, the um, break in uh, uh, usual activity incredibly rewarding and helpful they found a new vocation they can hear the birds singing they can attend to nature better so there have been lots of positives there have been fewer planes in the sky all sorts of positives have come out of it so how do we rebuild a society which takes advantage of what's happened but also attacks the structures which make some people so vulnerable and i have to i'll end on this point that we know this was going to happen because it's happened with other pandemics and disasters and crises so Yet again, we've forgotten. We didn't want to remember. We didn't learn from previous episodes. We had to rediscover it. And what we don't need to do is keep rediscovering it in the middle of a crisis. So here, here is the you know uh, we we've had pandemics and we and it just feel as though we haven't learned. So to to the question for me is on an individual level. Um, what I'm actively encouraging people to do is to be a bit more courageous and be a bit more bold um, and to raise their hand and to let people know within, you know, whether that's close relationships, working um, educational settings, that they're not okay at the moment. It is the people finding their voice and signaling saying, do you know something? Life isn't good for me today. Um, 
and not doing the, you know, try to be the superhuman being and, and that we've got it all nailed and we've got it all mastered and that we're on top of everything. Um, that's no longer helpful. So I think it's the, um, it's incumbent on us all now to just raise our hand and ask for help if we need it. Raise a hand and say, do you know what? I'm feeling tired. Today I'm not coping so well. Um, and, and, and ask for support, ask for support. So on an individual level to, to the person that's raised that question, that's what I would, I would encourage. Leverage your networks. Shuranjit? Nothing further to add. I think everything's been covered. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you. We've got another question um, that picks up on the institutional structural areas. Um, how does institutional racism impact upon the experiences of BIPOC with mental health treatments and services? We'll just open that to all, all of you. wants to go first so, I, so I, I, this concept has been knocked around obviously for a long time since Stephen Lawrence inquiry and, and and you know there are still people who don't accept that it's a legitimate vocabulary or a way of framing the problem uh, and I'm citing a lot of authors today but Tony Morrison talks about this being a distraction when you get into these arguments we need to be doing something about the problem rather than debating vocabularies and debating whether something exists or not people who are victims of racism know they're victims you know it's hard to admit you're a victim of racism but people who are experienced it know what it is they don't need a definition or a vocabulary and when there's so much evidence of structural inequalities that institutions continue to produce unequal outcomes, whether it's in health, education, criminal justice, social care, um, and other forms of employment practice. You know, we do have to interrogate that. And it's not just by race, it's by gender, by age, and by all sorts of other characteristics that we need to think about. So for me, institutional racism exists, but I know and I assume a third of the population I speak to or in any meeting anywhere will disagree with me probably and will not say that. They just go away and don't do anything about it but we need to get beyond that we need people on board because we need everyone's collective effort to really unpack what's going on to catch the moments in which the decision which leads to an analytical outcome is about to happen and that comes from actually recognizing when you're in such a position of privilege and power that you don't really feel the consequences and having the courage to give up power and resources to people who can use it better. That, that's, my, that's my sort of essence of what I would say. Obviously, it's a long, long conversation piece, but I'll give space to Shuranjit and Sue, who may have a, a different take on it. So I think when this question comes up about institutional structural racism, um, I'm taking from my experiences over the past you know, number of weeks, uh, volunteering in a community vaccination clinic, uh, where the population is vast, vast majority of uh, racialized folks. And because my, uh, the work I've been doing has largely been kind of weekday, weekday mornings, it's not been, you know, it's not been a huge amount of people coming through the door. So I've been able to spend a bit longer with people who are coming for their vaccinations and spending a bit longer with folks, especially folks who might be in other settings seen as, you know, problem patients in inverted commas or, uh, people who are like vaccine hesitant it's been able to kind of create a space where they can they can speak about their concerns and a fair number of the concerns i've been hearing have been related to challenging experiences within healthcare systems challenging experiences where uh, within healthcare systems and with uh, kind of other kinds of public services which you know have really compounded to uh, create a level of, of hesitancy or a level of distrust, which I know Sue touched on earlier. Um, and so these are the types of, some of the consequences that we can see from people's experiences of, of structural institutional uh, racism, discrimination, exclusion, uh, which have manifested through uh, way, you know, maltreatment, uh, stereotyping, uh, you know, gaslighting. So like kind of uh, trying to uh, distort someone's perception of, of, of reality and how this how this is so embedded in in, in various uh, kind of things we're experiencing at the moment no less um, the kind of vaccination drive that we're seeing up and down the country um, and so for me that was just that was something that had been on my mind for the last couple of weeks and it's something that I've been coming into contact with a few times a week in the mornings um, but I've been lucky to be able to have time to sit and speak with people and listen to them 
in a way that others may not have listened to them. You know, people who might have uh, had, you know, kind of challenging discussions when they were checking in to the, to, to the, to the clinic. Uh, but people, once they've left uh, left the room, uh, where myself and another person have said, oh, you're a really great guy. Thank you for listening to me. And it's coming back to that question of kindness and that question of, of having that space for, for open conversation, for reflection and for validation of people's experiences. Because, you know, we don't want to be we don't want to be there brushing things over and pretending these things don't exist, as was mentioned earlier, because that, that serves nothing apart from the status quo. And to build on, um, on, on, on the listening piece, um, so, you know, within our organisational cultures, uh, one of the things that really has emerged over the last 18 months um, is the, the need to listen more, um, to create spaces that are psychologically safe for people to bring their lived experience and to share their experiences and their concerns, their doubts, their anxieties and their fears. Um, the, the thing, though, is that um, what we do with that listening within an organisational setting, that our organisational structures, particularly those uh, our organisations that have been around for a very long time, 70 years plus, 100 years plus, 200 year old organisations, um, have been built on um, some, some frameworks that are, are, are possibly no longer relevant today. So there's a, there's a, there's a language, there's hierarchical structures, for example, um, that are, are cultural norms within our organizations. Um, there's, there's language that are cultural norms within our organizations. Um, and so one of the things what we've got now is a little bit of a culture clash emerging in a lot of our, inst our older institutions. So there's listening that needs to take place, absolutely, but then there also needs to be action. The, my concern is that when we talk about institutional racism is that we will just do the, well, we've listened, um, but we have to do something with that listening uh, within our organizations, I would argue, if we are going to tackle um, what I believe is um, institutional racism that sits almost invisible in some organizational settings, but is quite visible in others. Thank you very much. And I think we have just about run out of time for any more questions. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of our uh, speakers. And it's just been really great to hear from each of you. It's been so much said and so many different perspectives talked about. And yeah, it's really given, I think, a lot of food for thought for people listening. So thank you to our viewers for giving up an hour of your time and to our speakers as well. And it's just been a really pri great privilege to hear from you. And so thank you very much. And that's all from me. So good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Well, Sharanjit, my Sue. Thanks, Hannah. Um.